Welcome to a conversation on the future of conservation in America. And I love that conversation on conservation. And if it becomes a routed, politely heated conversation, that's good too. The aim tonight is to inspire, encourage, and educate so that each and every one of us walks out of here and the world becomes a little different and a lot better. My name is Jane Robolo. It is my joy to be your moderator tonight. I'm a 1982 graduate of Clemson University. Really happy that I got in when I did and got out when I did. Pretty sure that wouldn't happen with the grades I had in high school now. But I wear that 1982 graduation with great pride. It's always been my pleasure uh, and my honor to call myself a Clemson lady, and I have, and I've been very involved with the university, and it's a real joy and a treat to be involved with you all tonight, uh, because my son now is a freshman majoring in wildlife and fisheries biology. So it started somewhere, and it's continuing now. It is my joy to introduce to you your provost, a fine man. Bob Jones became Clemson University's chief academic officer and first executive vice president for academic affairs and provost in September of 2014. Provost Jones works closely with the president and with the board of trustees on major institutional priorities. He has responsibility for all facets of undergraduate and graduate education at Clemson University, academic support programs, outreach, and research. A two-time Clemson graduate, oh, he's got me beat. Jones earned a Bachelor of Science in Forest Management in 1979 and a Master of Science in Forestry in 1981. He completed his doctorate in Forest Ecology from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, Syracuse University, in 1986. Before returning to Clemson, he served as the Dean of the El Eberly College of Arts and Sciences at West Virginia University and as Department Head and Professor of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. His passion for higher education is driven by a personal dedication to community service and a love of nature, and I know a love of students as well. He has a passion for hiking, for birding, for boating and fishing, and he's restored a native prairie that's now protected by a conservation easement on his family's property in Virginia. In addition to being provost of the university, he is a tenured faculty member in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation here at Clemson University. Please give a nice warm welcome to your provost, Dr. Bob Jones. Thank you, Ms. Roblo. On behalf of Clemson University, I welcome our guests and participants in this very signature event. And it is fitting to discuss the future of conservation here at Clemson University, which from its inception in 1889 has been focused on sustainable agriculture and sustainable use of natural resources. In the 1930s, our institution and the federal government worked together to purchase land leading to what is now the Clemson Forest. 17,500 acre property immediately adjacent to Clemson's main campus and managed for sustainable production of timber, the protection of biodiversity and recreation. I believe it to be one of the most impressive and impactful acts of conservation ever conducted by an American university. That deserves it. Since 1903, Forestry courses have been taught at Clemson. And over the years, academic programs, research and outreach that include conservation principles have grown and expanded across the university and have now a significant presence in five of the university's seven colleges. In recent years, world-class scholars supported by endowed and titled professorships and the students they have attracted to Clemson have brought our university to the forefront of conservation's present and future state. We will hear from four of these outstanding scholars tonight, and I am grateful for their leadership and for the extensive contributions that they and their colleagues at Clemson are making to sustain the quality of our global environment. Jane, thank you so much for the opportunity to help get uh, started on tonight's event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What an honor this is for me. And 
One more personal note. It's just always wonderful when one of your own comes back to take such a high position as provost. So it's, it's great to have you back home again, too. I'm excited about this con conversation tonight because clearly I have a child who is a uh, student that is going to study the ecology and the environment and wildlife and fish. And that started when he was just a little tiny guy. And I put him down in the dirt, and we started looking at bugs. And then we caught frogs. And he was catching snakes by the time he was three, and I could not be more proud. Catch and release. So the question is that I would like to ask you all tonight, what does conservation mean to you? When you hear that word, what does it mean to you? What do you hold sacred? And I will tell you, younger folks in the audience, the older you get, the more you realize how sacred some things can become. So think about that tonight. What to you, at this age in your life, in this stage, is sacred to you? Is it your family? Is it your health? Maybe if you're a student, it's that blindingly bright light that is your future. Maybe it's all of the above. Each of those things, though, when you think about it, depends on a healthy environment. So yes, this conversation is about the beauty around us. And we do have a remarkably beautiful campus sustainable. It's about the sweet air that you breathe in. Oh, springtime is coming and you can just smell the flowers in the air. Some of you may sneeze, but that's okay too. It's about the cool fresh water that runs through our campus and through our hills. It's about the little frogs chirping. Don't you love springtime? Spring peeps make me so happy. It's about waking up in the morning and opening the front door and hearing birds before the sun comes up. You hear birds chirping. Never take any of that for granted. Never take any of those things for granted. Those are some of the things that I hold dear. But it's so much deeper than those things. We're going to go to the cellular level tonight. We're going to get down under your skin tonight. If we really want to make an impact, and we do, we have to excite individuals each one of you in this room and the people that you know out of this room when you leave here have got to be excited about this same kind of conversation. So that's what we want to do tonight. And every line of business and every line of work in your living, in your breathing, in your existence, conservation is key. And if you don't believe that now, you will within an hour. Our distinguished panelists tonight will introduce you to several aspects of this topic. I'm certain that you will be moved, you will be challenged, you will even be a bit disturbed, perhaps. You will be enlightened, you will be empowered, and I'm not overselling this. As you hear from each one of our wonderful guests tonight, you, I want you to feel free to jot down notes. I'm going to be taking notes, feel free to do the same. Whether you do it with one of these, this is called a pen, very old-fashioned instrument. Or if you do it with these, my son is actually faster with his thumbs, but take notes. This is a conversation we want to hear from you. There will be an opportunity for us to open it up to the floor. Your thoughts and your questions are not only welcome, they are encouraged tonight. Once you've heard from each one of our speakers, we'll open the, the floor to you. Great conversations often ignite great movements, and that's what we're hoping for tonight, too, that some sparks will be set in you that will indeed change things for the better. We are also in launching a very important work tonight. Dr. Gary Matchless has co-authored a book called The Future of Conservation in America, but don't miss the subtitle, A Chart for Rough Water. You will be able to get your own copy, I promise, right up at the front, autographed at the conclusion of our conversation. He will meet you just outside the door. Many thanks to the University Bookstore for sponsoring that. We appreciate that very much. Now let's introduce the author. Dr. Gary Matchless has worked on conservation issues worldwide. He's a professor of environmental sustainability at Clemson University. From 2009 to 2017, he served as the first scientist, the first scientist, appointed to the position of science advisor to the director of the National Park Service. I think that deserves a wow. <laughs> He's worked on conservation issues throughout the United States. 
He's worked in China on the giant panda, in Kenya on wildlife management, the Galapagos Islands, Haiti, and other locales. He is the co-author of this new book, The Future of Conservation in America, A Chart for Rough Water. It's by the University of Chicago Press, copies of which he will sign at the conclusion of the event. I've been told to call him by his first name. Welcome, Gary. conversation about a key part of America's future. As an Idahoan recently transplanted to South Carolina, I am grateful for and often awed by the national, natural beauty of this state and the deep heart of its people. And I want to share greetings from my co-author, John Jarvis, who served as the 18th director of the National Park Service and briefly introduce you to our new little book. For reasons that will become obvious, the ideas and views presented are ours alone. As individuals with 40 years each experience in conservation politics, and they do not reflect the official views of Clemson University. We wrote the future of conservation for several reasons. We wanted to sound the alarm over the current assault by the Trump administration on conservation. We wanted to use our lessons learned to describe how this turbulent time for conservation, what we call rough water, is impacting the American landscape and how it might unfold beyond this current administration. We also wrote to provide practical strategies for action. It is not enough to be outraged or to recite a litany of environmental harm being done. There are essential and effective strategies that can advance the cause of conservation in America in ways that are bipartisan, respectful of differences, science-informed, forward-looking, and practical. And we wanted to share these strategies and encourage their use. Finally, we wrote to declare our confidence in the resilience of the American conservation movement and, and I choose my words carefully, the patriotic contribution to the nation. Our small book is illustrated with a photograph for each chapter and there is a reason that the final chapter is illustrated with a large American flag and a 4th of July parade because we believe conservation is a necessary and vital part of the American future. So our book charts a, a path from alarm to practical action to optimism. And I want to briefly share with you those three elements. The immediate assault on conservation is wide ranging and it includes abandoning the Paris Climate Accord, which every country in the world except the United States is party to eliminating citizen advisory groups, removing university faculty from other advisory groups because they received funding for university research, all the while stacking those advisory groups with industry paid officials. Failing to staff for the first time since 1976 the critical position of science advisor to the president, removing public access to scientific data, erasing important websites for citizens to gain information about environmental concerns, proposing the elimination of successful conservation collaborations that have involved industry and environmentalists working together, such as the Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes Initiative, rescinding resource management policies that protect national parks and working to reduce the size of national monuments that were created by both Republican and Democrat administrations, cutting funding for climate change research and adding layers of political review to research proposals submitted by universities like Clemson and proposing to expand accident prone offshore deep water drilling, including on the sensitive coast of South Carolina, 
while at the same time proposing to lower the already low royalty payments by oil companies that are used to support local conservation through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which has been in place since 1964, and weakening the core of federal conservation laws, such as the Clean Water Act, most of which were established under President Nixon. These actions directly harm conservation and degrade the protection of the nation's lands, waters, and communities and families that depend on them. And there is more to come. The populist movement, with its resentment of scientific experts, the media, minorities, immigrants, and the federal government, will extend beyond this current administration. Conservation groups and university scientists will continue to be included in this collection of resented interests. In addition, the challenges facing conservation are even more structural and long-term. In the book, we note as follows, quote, regardless of political party, narrow self-interest, or even well-intentioned actions, there are major environmental and social threats that confront America. They form the underlying causes that frame our immediate conservation problems. Three of these threats serve as interdependent examples, climate change, species extinction, and economic inequality. For conservation to navigate these rough waters, there's a need for both the immediate and the long view to respond to the current threats and the underlying causes, to act with what we call strategic intention a fancy way of saying, act, but act smart. In our book, we outline 14 specific strategies for the future of conservation. Yes, many of them have been employed by some conservation groups in some places throughout the country, but we call for them to be more broadly applied across the nation. They include the creation of data havens to ensure the integrity of conservation science and improved training for scientists to be better communicators. Engaging youth in conservation and national service to promote lifelong care for the national heritage. Working, excuse me, working more effectively with local residents in conservation efforts and building understanding, cooperation, and trust as conservationist Lucas St. Clair did in Maine, where he had to travel from town to town and essentially work conservation, quote, over a thousand cups of coffee. And we make clear that's not a bad metric. If you want to accomplish something and have local support, be prepared to drink a thousand cups of coffee. Engaging with respect communities of color who often have limited access to green space or do not see their histories represented and rural residents who make a living from public lands encouraging conservationists to run for elected office and giving them the tools they need to win. And importantly, we challenge older conservation veterans like ourselves to promote an intergenerational transfer of power and responsibility to an emerging younger conservation leadership. For it's their future that's at stake. The student survivors of Parkland's tragic shootings are demonstrating that young people can lead. We should not forget that the two youngest signers of the Declaration of Independence represented South Carolina, Thomas Lynch Jr. and Edward Rutledge, both of them who were just 26 years old when they signed the Declaration of Independence. In addition, and perhaps more importantly, most importantly, our experience suggests the conservation movement must greatly expand its base. And we call for a unified vision that binds nature protection, historical preservation, business sustainability, public health, civil rights and social justice and science all into common cause. Too often, Portions of the conservation movement struggle among themselves for priority, funding, membership, and more. We quote Ben Franklin and remind conservationists they must either hang together or surely.
they will hang separately. We write in the book, there will be a time when the physician, the pastor, the park ranger, the business leader, the scientist, and the school teacher, all working together for conservation, will seem not unusual, but expected. Now, a determined and more unified conservation movement will not only navigate the current rough, rough water, but also make significant and sustained advances. And we ground our optimism in the resilience of our national values, our institutions, the conservation movement, and most of all, our faith in the American people. We write, there are deep American values that even now bind us together. Americans harbor a need to be respected as individuals and for their families to have futures equal to or better than the present can provide. They expect to have their lives matter, to not be forgotten or abused by their government, and to have a voice within their community and civil society. Most Americans share a deep sense of place that the landscape they live in is an important part of their lives. Ranchers in West Texas, urbanites in West Seattle, and factory workers in West Virginia can speak with fervent care and, yes, with love about their portion of the American landscape. A conservation movement that remembers these values and acts to embrace them is likely to be successful. We are taking the future of this little book on the road with the strategic intention of promoting a national dialogue on conservation because we believe that the future of the movement is with new and younger leadership we are visiting university and college campuses across the country. We will be presenting the alarm and the practical strategies and the optimism about conservation that populate this book. We will be listening carefully to what the next generation have to say about the future. The dialogue may be quiet and reflective or loud and raucous. Conservation matters to Americans. And I can find no better place to start that conversation than here at Clemson University and in South Carolina. Thank you. Amen, brother. Preach it. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Rob Baldwin. Dr. Rob Baldwin's understanding of conservation has come from many years of working with people to conserve land. He's the professor of conservation biology and GIS and Margaret H. Lloyd Smart State Endowed Chair in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation here at Clemson University. He's traveled and taught widely. He's a long record of publishing in the scientific and popular press on issues related to conservation. And his recent article, The Future of Landscape Conservation, was co-authored with leaders from the conservation world. In South Carolina, he's working extensively with partners in the business and conservation arenas to produce a sustainable plan for the state's future, Palmetto Green. Please welcome Rob. Wow, I'm not sure how to go after Gary, and so I'm going to do what I normally do and put everybody to sleep. <laughs> um, imagine you are looking at a beautiful painting, the Mona Lisa. You are asked to cut it into pieces and then throw away two-thirds of them. You ask why. This is just the way things are done. It's how to survive. When you are finished, what is left is the frame with some large and small pieces scattered about. This is an array of disconnected fragments. Most of the remaining space is blank. This does not look like the Mona Lisa. But essentially, this is what our very successful species has done to wild nature. What happens is this. When habitats are fragmented, the smallest islands lose species faster than the larger ones. Those more connected to each other retain species longer. The patches closer to the larger ones 
retain species longer. The space between the patches that is blank in the painting actually has some value from practically zero, like the center of a six lane highway, to moderately good, like the edge of an agricultural field. Urban areas, farmlands, and highways filter out many species. The environment we have created has become homogenized and fragmented. Species bleed from the smaller and less connected patches, and the conditions of the blank spaces invade sometimes hundreds of meters so that core intact forest, wetland, or grassland shrinks like the soft center of a donut. The effect of all of this habitat degradation has been colossal. Literally, humans have become a geologic scale force. The current epoch we are in has been termed the Anthropocene, following the post-glacial Holocene epoch. This human era has been accompanied by the sixth mass extinction. We are doing to the planet what massive geological, biological, and atmospheric forces did five previous times in our four and a half billion year history. That's happening now. We sit here in the beautiful upstate of South Carolina and think, extinction crisis? What extinction crisis? This is a great place to live. The land, water, everything is beautiful here. The condition of the land is, in many ways, better than it was 100 years ago. What were once overused farms are, in many areas, mature forests now. We have had a century of effective wildlife law. Deer and turkey are abundantly distributed. We are in the temperate forest of eastern North America, which is naturally buffered from climate change. But if you look under the canopy of the trees, the view is not so great. The tendrils of urbanization that Atlanta, D.C. megalopolis is reaching us. Busy roads snake everywhere. Once common and loved species like the box turtle are in steep decline because of road mortality, mostly females. Their habitats are fragmented just like that painting. So what do we do? We decided we like the Mona Lisa after all. We want it back, or at least something like it. We begin by restoring more patches. We draw connections, corridors between them. People need to live and work the land, so conservationists work in the matrix of farms and working forests to restore their ecological functions. We remember that wild nature is dynamic. There is creative destruction. Natural disturbances create diversity. Fire does maintain whole ecosystems, but fire even low intensity does need space and time. Hurricanes come through and wreck old forests. Those gaps create diversity, but natural areas need to be large enough to absorb those changes. And we need to remember that even if a forest is intact, it could be empty. Disease and exotic insects, global hitchhikers, have caused steep population declines in bats, amphibians, and many trees, such as the eastern hemlock. If we are careful and connect and restore and protect where need be and manage well, we will once see, again, see a glimmer of the Mona Lisa. How much does nature need? Mounting evidence is suggesting that in order to maintain biodiversity, we need 50% of the land area managed for that goal. This does not mean people can't live and work there. Farms, forests, lakes, and rivers, and shorelines can still produce for the economy and harbor habitats. Some areas would be forever wild, dominated by natural pattern and process. That might be a third of the landscape, that if laid out well, connected well, and patches of the right size, would be for those species that need to be far from people. Think grizzly bears, European wolves, or Bengal tigers, for obvious reasons. Even such a fearsome predator that has been maintained in parks in one of the most densely populated parts of the world, in India. The greatest threat to the tiger is when it leaves those protected areas, as it often must do. So to protect the tiger, the heart and soul of this university, requires actions by people in the landscapes around those parks, which are fragments of the former whole. In fact, social scientists have told us that conservation of the rarest species can't be effective without healthy human communities near them. 
When we take the whole system's view and manage landscapes and seascapes towards specific goals, it can work. We can repair and restore landscapes. Why should we care? Our very lives depend on intact functioning ecosystems. Nature services have been free for a long time. We don't pay a forest landowner for the clean water that filters off their land into the rivers and reservoirs. Maybe we should. We don't pay a landowner for the native bees that emerge from a natural patch of habitat and fly into a neighboring field to pollinate those crops. Maybe we should. Near Charleston, one of our graduate students has found 45 species of native bees that pollinate watermelon. 40, did you know there were 45 species of native bee? I, I mean, and that's here in this state. We are here today because of the call for action that is in the book written by Gary and the former director of the National Park Service, John Jarvis. About a month ago, some colleagues of mine and I did something similar, but in a much more, I don't know, uh, timid way. Um, we took on a political decision that was made to eliminate a program begun only eight years ago whose goal it was to collaborate across boundaries to protect wildlife. We published a paper called The Future of Landscape Conservation, and in it, we did call out a lack of forethought by certain elected parties. The program that was cut is called the Landscape Conservation Cooperatives of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In fact, Clemson has played a big role in the LCCs. Why would we cut a conservation program at such a defining moment in history? The cost of it was minimal, just three one-hundredths of a percent of the federal science budget. The answer is politics. When the LCCs were established in 2010, it was argued that they would help us be resilient to climate change. That is still true, but it's no longer politic to say. Who are we at Clemson? Clemson, with its land-grant history, as Provost Jones said, exemplifies American conservation. The Clemson Forest really did begin as a landscape restoration project. Clemson once had a train that traveled the state teaching sustainable practices. Did you all know that? It traveled town to town. Today, we have many conservation leaders I have personally worked with and know in humanities, architecture, agriculture, forestry, engineering, extension, and biology. If, that, if there is a single theme at Clemson, it is the environment. I can't think of another theme that cuts across everything. The provost is our chief academic officer, and he is an ecologist. In his conference room, there is only one decoration. There are three large paintings, each of a species of bird. The ivory-billed woodpecker may be extinct. The Carolina parakeet, gone in our time. And the blue jay, and we all know the blue jay. In some ways, each of these represents one of those types of patches or blank spaces in the painting we cut up. I feel lucky that we have a leader at Clemson with a commitment to an understanding of conservation. Biodiversity conservation is ultimately about self-preservation, psychologically, spiritually, and economically. We need to be near those patches. We walk, we ride, we boat, forest, bathe, watch wildlife, and we recreate. Finally, the cost of losing something as humble as the box turtle or as stupendous as the tiger is not fully known. We have them now, and we're likely to not. The conservation biologist Michael Soule commented, without wild animals in our lives, we are sure to lose contact with the roots and marrow of our humanity. Thank you.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Rob. Dr. Drew Lanham is a native of Edgefield, South Carolina, a conservation ornithologist, or as he sometimes says, he's a bird brain. He said it. He's a naturalist. He's a hunter conservationist. Drew is also an alumni distinguished professor and alumni master teacher at Clemson University. He's intrigued with how culture and ethnic prisms can bend perceptions of nature and its care. And he's a speaker who eloquently connects the birds, race, and conservation ethics. He's the author of The Home Place, A Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature, published by Milkweed Editions, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Sparrow Envy, A Book of Poetry, by Whole Scene Press, Spartanburg, South Carolina. Welcome, Drew. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jess, to come. Thank you, thank you, Jane, for that introduction. And, and thank you to my department chair, Greg Yarrow, who's had the vision to see this forward and to, and to bring us all together tonight. So in, in sort of that spirit of together, I'd like to share with you a bit about convergence and something that I call a, a conservationist's manifesto to move forward. How do we come together in these divisive times to squeeze the goodness from the sour to make something sweet? How do we reconcile free dreams grounded when the wild flight of the very birds we adore are compromised after a century of protection and thrown as deregulated sacrifice on the altars of the great again heap? How do we redirect and correct the diversion of flowing streams trying to recover that are once again the legal dumping grounds for mountaintop mining and anthracite extraction that is anything but clean? From this and every other sin, how do we secure the sustainable eco-win when the warming earth swells our seas and compromises the very air that we breathe? Then, my friends, the conversation becomes more than one of simple conservation. This is survival. The fine line between life and death defined by how intensely we care. It is survival for each and every one of us with wings and fins and fur and warty toed skin. It is the sacred soil we sink our toes and roots into and the heavens above we raise our hands to in praise of clouds and the gods we revere. It is the tumbling rivers we seek like salmon drawn home to final spawn. It is the patch of woods where we find comfort and shelter like thrushes, wind tossed on migratory journeys, driven down by battering storm. How do we defeat a wall of worry being built to keep hope out? Do we climb over it, tunnel under, or simply give up? And so I will ask you, from what azimuth does the leadership come? Is it north or south, east or west? Is it black or white or red or brown? Is it woman or man or gender undefined? Is it old or is it young? Is it me, is it you? The only solution, the only solution I find to this equation posed is that it is all of us. It is that that makes us uniquely us. It is the intentional inclusion of culture into this dialogue. The braiding of color, ethnic, and identity streams into, ecolog into ecology enlarges it to become the ecology that Marvin sings of. It is what's going on and mercy, mercy me in the here and now. 
This can become the everywhere to be and the future then to come. It must also grow to encompass Aldo's cogs and his wheels and intelligent tinkering and beauty and integrity and stability and harmony and thinking not just like the mountain, but like the whole damn craggy peaked range and the grass waving prairie sweep that it looms over and the rivers that flow through it and the forests that rise from the sycamore studded draws. And yes, the birds and beasts that roam through it all. It is also the devastating hurricanes and driving flood rains and blizzard bomb snows that come at odd times and too frequently now, but then suddenly too we're in earth cracking drought and consuming hellish firestorm. Our challenge, my friends, is the overflowing, warmed up oceans dying deeply, overfished, overpolluted, and overdrilled in. It is the drowning coast some would deny an unpotable toxic water along a low country quarter of shame that somehow seems to always end up in someone else's backyard. If this is what's to come of us and them, the fate of humanity interwoven with those things wild and fierce green fired eyed and free, if what we seek to successfully fathom is a clearer way forward to some better conservation day, then the past cannot be passed by. It cannot be ignored. So we must repeat the good of Thoreau and Muir and Roosevelt and Leopold and Pincho and Carson and George Washington Carver it has in large brought us to this place. But then all the stories have not been good. No matter what the pain of remembering might cost, we must memorialize, respect, tell the stories of what's happened before we can fully move forward. If names must be changed on granite or bricks or steel, then so it must be. But if they must remain, conserve the whole story and let the truth explain who they truly were, including the evil enacted and shame they've lain. Dig up these stories that tell of connections willing and unwilling. Down there in our lovely low country ace, there is brackish marsh covered in wintering waterfowl and long-legged waders, a sanctuary for winged wonder now, but built and paid for back then on the backs of enslaved women and men. Black ducks and black rails are possible in many ways now because of black hands. Carolina gold rice and I high sea island cotton netted riches for the planter class, but then grew the whole nation beyond colony to current superpower status. Know then that we are all connected to this land somehow through past bondage or the choices we make or don't make now. I claim in the name of my ancestors 40 acres multiplied a million times over and enough mules to plow a row from here to forever. In this claim, I promise to care and promote the good and not let this evil ever happen again, no matter how great again it might seem to some. And so I ask once more, how do we take the bitter to find the sweet? Optimist though I may be at heart, the daily flash flood of news stream and bombastic tweet have backed up behind my brain dam through which little else sometimes it seems to flow. At times I feel as though I'm drowning in rising tides of neglect, lying and denying. If you find that it is all somehow fine to denigrate nature in the name of growth and nationalism, then have at it, but we cannot claim kinship in your negligence. Unfriend me. <laughs> At times, I feel like a great polarized bear, and there is no place of reason, discussion, or care for our world where I can haul out. For all of my professional life, I've leaned on the science, the facts, the immutable truths that data gathered and analyzed and published would be enough. I know clearly now that it is not. After so much paddling about in this sea of pondering, I came to this yet solidly frozen flow of understanding where my thoughts might gather res respite to carry on. Head lends us to the hard facts. 
habitat loss and extinction at sobering rates, warming oceans rising and coastal inundation, disconnections from nature's healing tends us towards poor health and the abilities to resist what ails us. We are falling from the edge of an outdoor deficit disorder to full on dystopic pandemonium. The dwindling majority populace feels this around the edges. The expanding minority populace feels it deeper down. Our environmental ills are a coal to some, to others suffering in persistent persecution of discrimination and lack of environmental connection, it is the worst kind of flu. There are few vaccines that will cure a broken earth beyond our care and courage to act. As my conservation scientist peers and I gather and regather the numbers to understand what is, where it is, when it is, and ultimately how it is, in this current context of angst, riddle, anthropocene, it is time for us to reap the harvest of hearts as well. Contrary to popular belief, this does not call for less rigor in the science that we do. In fact, it calls on us to dig deeper and work harder for it. Contrary to long-held conviction, it does not rest on us remaining silently objective assumers, hoping that the knowledge will carry the day. Rather, it calls for informed advocacy and our ability to translate 280-page dissertations into the 280-character social media messaging that translates and delivers the punch of peer review to thousands, to thousands with an impact factor that will be measured in millions at town hall meetings and ballot boxes. A picture is indeed sometimes worth more than a whole special journal issue. Art and music and literature are the canyons and hollers and bottomlands that culture rages and ebbs and flows through. We cannot afford now to be riven apart from them. Contrary to the privileged choirs that have always been sung to, it will require us to lift every voice and sing such that the harmony of a healthier earth and environmental justice equitably applied and natural resources conservation ring true to black and brown and red and white too. This mission of land grant is to instruct, to investigate, and then to extend that learning beyond the walls and the journal pages to everyone, everyone. In every realm of us that is, include the considerations for what conservation actually means. We must always ask first. We must listen, we must relate, we must act, we must love. Ask, listen, relate, act, love. And so, yes, I am saying that we must think and feel our way forward through this. It is a darkened time now with common sense shuttered and care eclipsed. In that totality, our brains have limited capacity in this lifting. They will only take us so far. I know that for so many of us, this will be the harder struggle. The thinking is actually the easy thing. What will be difficult is moving hearts with the thinking that we do. The way forward through this blindness will be to light the way with the flame that ignited us to spend our lives in quest of wild things in the first place. It was not the promise of riches, but the prospect of becoming enriched. That is the sweet that cannot ever be soured. No matter how dour or cynical the day may seem, my friends, let's feel our way forward now and find the sweetest things remaining. Thank you. I did mention in the introduction that Drew is a poet. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jesse Wood. Jesse Wood is a graduate student researcher and leader who came to Clemson University's master's program in wildlife and fisheries biology with a BS in biology at Furman University. 
I wore my purple just for you. She came via a Western North Carolina job in land stewardship. She's interested in exploring opportunities for conservation beyond the traditional protected areas, whether in urban or rural systems, on public or on private lands, with songbirds or with large animals. With Dr. Beth Ross and the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, she is currently studying bird communities on private South Carolina agricultural lands enrolled in farm bill conservation programs. Please welcome Jesse. Thank you, Jane. When I was in elementary school, I ended a speech with the line, my name is Jesse Wood and I am a young citizen of the world. It was very dramatic and it got a lot of applause. And I open with that tonight because some of you may wonder what I'm doing on stage. Um, what qualifies me to speak tonight? And the answer is simple, I'm a citizen of the world. I eat, sleep, breathe, work, and play on this earth. And so I have a right to be up here, and so do you. And I'm so looking forward to our conversation in the next half. I have to admit, it feels a little bit like I've graduated to sitting at the big kids table. <laughs> um, I wanna take a second to thank my co-panelists for their dedication to this field, totaling over 100 years of service. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they may not appreciate this, but each one of them has been doing this longer than I've been alive. So. <laughs> I bring the millennial perspective tonight. My generation has been well trained by the generation here on stage. We're gonna face some known and some unknown challenges because our ecological, social, and political systems are constantly changing. But I think we're well prepared. I'm not concerned so much about us doing the science. I think we've been doing that well. I'm not concerned about us filling in gaps of knowledge. We'll continue to do that. Where I think there's work to be done is in translating the message to reach the right audiences. You've heard about some challenges and some strategies already tonight, and I've got some thoughts to share based on my own personal experiences, so I hope you'll indulge me. Um, the first is about how I got here. There's no one way into this field, and I think that's becoming more and more true. This passion often starts with a personal connection to nature as a child, but it doesn't always, and it's sometimes unpredictable. My initial plans were to be a butterfly when I grew up. <laughs> Next, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I wasn't so sure about tapeworms and sutures and crying owners, so then I really figured it out. I was going to be a wild girl who lived in the woods with the animals. And thank goodness, what we usually have in common is someone along the way who has encouraged us, or at least challenged us, to change our mind about something. If I had to give just one example tonight, it would be Dr. John Quinn, my senior thesis advisor at Furman, who introduced me to the concept of anthromes, which reclassifies terrestrial biomes, you know those ones you made dioramas of in middle school, into human populated biomes. And this has forever changed the lens through which I view conservation. There's just no way to take humans out of the equation at this point. So why not study wildlife where people live? In urban systems, in agricultural systems. These are the places that the perceived conflicts sometimes arise. On private lands, since most of our state is not managed by the Department of Natural Resources, but by private landowners who make decisions every day that affect our collective natural resources. So I realized not everyone needs to be a wolf biologist in Yellowstone. I study La Bali Pines now, which is about as unromantic as it gets. Um, but I think there's a, a great argument for studying conservation in these places, and I'm just so grateful for the village that shaped my perspective of conservation along the way. So I'm gonna move now into some of the lessons I've learned from a work experience I'm proud of, one that I think is a good example of bottom-up conservation. Practicing conservation is a lot like leading a good volunteer work day. You have to identify your needs in the context, you have to prepare for the work, gather your resources, recruit people, anticipate their needs to keep them happy, and then reevaluate the problem at the end of the day to see if you're gonna have to plan another work day. 
In my last job at a land conservancy, I organized a lot of these volunteer work days. Sometimes we removed trash or treated invasive species, but sometimes we rebuilt trails to make them less erosible. This is a situation with multiple stakeholders with different objectives. There's the land trust who would rather protect water quality by limiting all impactful recreation activities, but also felt the, that it was important to keep the protected land open to the public. There was the community who was going to walk, bike, or four-wheel across this property regardless, and who may not have been aware of the impact that their tread was having on the land. So there's the scene. We did our trail work on a little piece of private land, but that land was adjacent to national forest land, and in fact, it acted as quite an unintentional gateway for people, vehicles, invasive species, so it's a good reminder that our landscapes are connected, as Rob illustrated so well. So there's a number of lessons I learned from coordinating these workdays. Number one, it always begins with identifying the problem. Your research has to be extensive enough so that you know your options. The problem here was loose sediment from the unofficial trails washing into high-quality trout streams. In conservation science, we start with observations made in the field documenting, monitoring, doing the basic science so that we can, step two, plan and prepare. We use that knowledge to help make a good plan for applying resources toward a particular problem to solve it. Lesson number three, you have to have the right tools or you can't get the work done. Your resources need to be in place. You can't expect 30 people to cut and smooth the trail with blunt shovels and no Pulaski's. You just can't. I think the right tools we can have as conservationists are communication and critical thinking skills on top of a solid scientific training. These will allow us to address varied problems as they arise. Number four, this is a big one. None of the planning mattered unless we had people show up. The tasks were too big for staff alone. That's why we needed volunteers. So this was a, a two-part um, strategy. First, you have to get people there. You have to attract them through outreach, communication. Conservation issues in general have to be made relatable, and I think that actions and solutions need to be made accessible. But once you had them there, you had to keep them there. This was backbreaking work. It was not fun. Uh, you had to show them why it was important. Now, it was helpful when you could see your progress along the way. That was always good. But if you couldn't, you needed to get them to learn or experience something new to make the day worthwhile. What it often takes is offering some sort of incentive. And lots of conservation is done this way, and I think it's practical. For example, cost share programs offer assistance for people to do best management practices when it might otherwise be a little expensive for them. Land protection is made an easier sell when there are tax incentives in place so that the landowner receives an immediate payoff for what is mostly long-term benefits. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has agreements to make it slightly easier on landowners where threatened and endangered species occur. I believe in the best of people to be selfless, but it never hurts to have a few incentives. At the end of these work days, people were usually dripping with sweat, with dirt, and aching for a shower, but they were grinning like fools in the group pictures we'd take at the end. They'd feel like they'd done something worthwhile. If nothing else, they'd gotten outside. Maybe they'd sign up for the next work day. And maybe next time, thank you, Jesse, but they'll just send a check. <laughs> but undoubtedly, they will think about that little piece of land again and why it was important that trails be sustainable. And that kind of awareness is essential in getting people more committed in the long term. So my final lesson about work days was that we always got something out of it that I wasn't planning on. Dr. Macklis has an image in his book which he's already shared of the physician, pastor, park ranger, business leader, scientist, and school teacher working together. Well, add in a middle school student and a lawyer, and I had a representative of all of these at my trail work days. These people had different backgrounds, different day jobs, very different ideologies but they were unified to get there by a shared love of the region they were working in, or simply a value that community service is an important part of living. When I stopped directing long enough to step back and listen to the conversations that would arise, 
as people sweated side by side finding commonalities they didn't expect, well, that was something I could not have predicted or orchestrated. So thank you for indulging me in my metaphor. Thank you for listening to my thoughts. I'm still early in my career. I'm still forming my perspectives of conservation. But what I've realized is it's a lot more about people than I ever thought. You can't make conservation happen in a vacuum. We need to understand that each of us has a worldview shaped by our experiences, and we can probably come up with the best ideas if we acknowledge that wealth and diversity. We should listen to one another and be open to being transformed by these conversations we're having. And unfortunately, we can't do any of that if we are just wild girls living in the woods. We have to be present and engaged at the table. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the voice of the future of conservation, and it was a strong, wonderful voice. Jesse, thank you. That was terrific. Uh, what a great number of topics you all brought up, and I feel like I get to be the professor now for just a moment because I took lots of notes, and I hope that you all did too. We'll bring those out so that we can share in this discussion. Um, one of the things that strikes me, I think that, that I heard each one of you talking about, that I had never given thought to before, um, and, and probably my question will be very simple, is that we're not all really connected. I know as individuals, we learn a lot of what we learn in our backyard. If our parents gave us access to the wild things that were out there, even without being wild girls, but one theme, and I know that you write about it in the book, Gary, as well, is that there, is, uh, there are certain ethnicities who are locked out. Drew spoke of it very eloquently. Gary writes about it. Rob and Jesse touched on it. Gary, let's start with you, and I'd like to hear from each one of you on that. Why did that happen? That could be a whole nother hour. But how do we unlock that? How do we, as we look at engaging individuals, how do we first reach out to engage groups of people? Is, is this on? Oh, good. Um, first, I, I'm just so amazed. I mean, look at that. It's, it was an extraordinary presentation. And Jesse, thanks for reminding me that you represent the... <laughs> the that you represent the future and I represent the end. You know? <laughs> um, and I think that the locking out happens in several ways. There is a historical pattern in the United States. Um, certainly, slavery in this country has created unusual links to the land. And also, I believe that our economic inequality gets represented in an environmental inequality. Polluted water, a lack of green space, a lack of access, et cetera. So economic inequality and environmental inequality go hand in hand. At the same time, there has always been, for example, in national parks, an African-American middle class that cared about nature, Hispanic Americans who cared about nature, and that we have to find a way to make relevancy of parks and open space a much broader thing. That relevancy can happen in many different ways. On the book tour, we're going to be at San Francisco State University speaking in Cesar Chavez Auditorium. And it will be great fun and raucous because under the administration that I was part of, Cesar Chavez National Monument was established to commemorate the role of Chavez, the, the lettuce union, the boycott, and the whole advance of field workers. So part of this is to create relevant connections for each group of Americans that act as glue to bring us all together. I believe we will have succeeded as a country when Stonewall, the new national monument that commemorates the beginning of the LGBT movement in the United States, becomes visited not just by the LGBT community, 
but all Americans to see it as part of history. When we get there, we will have achieved something extraordinary. Gary, you talk about connecting these spaces. Is there some connection between connecting people to spaces and connecting the spaces? Yes. Um, I've always thought of science as a story and that fascination with the natural world is the basis for science. So it's just curiosity. And, but that goes away when you don't have experience with the natural world. So people just need to get outside. And then they're drawn to the complexity and beauty of these things all around us and even in our human communities. And that binds people together, these shared interests. And then you get drawn into the story of how to fix it. And I think we've lost, science is a monolith to most people and it seems inaccessible and there's good reasons for that. We have failed in communicating, um, but we've also failed in trying to learn. Like we've also failed in curiosity. So I just want people to know that, you know, these topics are very accessible and you can enjoy the outdoors and learn about natural history. And that brings people together. It's real simple, shared interests. Joe, you grew up in a rural part of South Carolina. Um, did that kind of help connect you to the land? And then how do we connect ethnic groups who have been locked out? How do we reach out? Yeah, um, you know, Jane, well, Edgefield, is a, that's another word for rural. Um, <laughs> if, if you know where Edgefield is, and so there were, you know, we were outnumbered by, by deer and turkey when they were trying to restore them everywhere else, it seems. So um, that certainly was, was a key in that sort of nurturing um, and nature for me with my parents being both farmers and school teachers, life sciences teachers. So that was important for me um, one, of, one of the issues that I have as people approach me about issues today as I, I go around the country talking about it is they first and foremost want to go at issues of urban kids. And, and urban is code, really. And, and so I, I try to get folks out of that code of what urban means. And I tell them, look, I'm a country boy from South Carolina. And unbeknownst to a lot of folks who want to sort of concentrate on urban issues, there are a lot of us in rural America. So, uh, you know, those connections that I had growing up in Edgefield, um, in the forests and fields and, and on the creeks, um, inform who I am. And I think a part of the story that, that Rob talks about um, is this, this curiosity that all of us have. And so part of the, and it's almost not a reconnection, because that's a, that's a little bit of hubris on our, our parts, I think. It's understanding what the connections are. So as a birder, um, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about, man, why aren't there more people who look like me out there birding? When, when really the question was, what are people out there doing? And, I, and, and even though I would like to think that what I do is subsistence birding, that it feeds my soul, um, where I see people of color in particular, I go to the low country and I see people fish in the creeks and, um, and I see people out of doors and I know people who, who are out hunting, and they're connected to the land in ways that often aren't recognized um, and, and aren't really counted. So I think part of it is us stepping back, and, and we've all talked about sort of relevance and recognizing and saying, okay, before I go in and count you as participating or not participating in the way that I would have you participate, how are you connected? And you, and you begin to understand those connections and that it's important for people who are fishing in those creeks in the low country, it's not just fun, but it's food. Mm. So, you know, those, those connections are important. So for me, it's a matter of stepping back out of who I am as a birder or as a hunter and the way that I do things and the way that I see things to allow other people to define their way of connecting. Jesse, what's your perspective on that? And, and I would say, what's your perspective from your generation? Well, I think everybody's mentioned something that deserves following up on, but um, I think that sometimes the challenge is just bringing the resources to people. So uh, 
beginning that connection to nature or something outdoors, I think is sometimes easiest to facilitate at a younger age. And the, the best place that most people have in common, most people go to K through 12 school. So are in school, school programs and opportunities that can be supplemented by, by things like AmeriCorps programs that I've participated in. Um, I was fortunate enough to come to a commissioner's school for agriculture program as a high schooler here at Clemson. And I think because there's a barrier sometimes in, in getting students out, and whether it's urban students who don't have the, the green spaces to get out and walk around and experience nature, um, or you know whether it's physical resources, a lot of outdoor uh, activities are expensive. Um, but, but birding is a great example. Birding can be free. Now, a good pair of binoculars will set you back $200, but, but otherwise, going outside, even to a parking lot, if there's a couple trees there, um, it, you can open up a whole world. So I don't know where all, the, where all the opportunities need to come from, but I think they're there, and I think there's great potential in any space that you're in. So. Well, and, and I'd like to open this up to, the, to you all now, too. Are these my microphones for out there? We've got mics. Okay, terrific. I've been behind that other microphone, so now I'll let them turn this one up. We want to hear from you all. And, and I think this awesome book about natural, uh, the national parks, they're celebrated 100 years in 2016. So that's a great place where I think our forefathers who created these spaces and the newer spaces that you've created that do speak to other communities that have been left out of that discussion, those are the places where our government has said, here's where you can connect. Let me hear from some folks in the audience. You've got four folks here. Uh, yes, sir, right here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Before I make a few remarks, I'd like to have all of us join again in a round of applause. What an awesome forum. Yes. Thank you. I know everybody on the stage. I'm Rick Kaminsky, the director of the James C. Kennedy Waterfall and Wetlands Conservation Center here at uh, Clemson University. And we're housed down in that wonderful low country near Georgetown, South Carolina. But all y'all, thank you for your fact. Thank you for your philosophy. Thank you for your poetry, Drew. <laughs> thank you for your passion. I would agree wholeheartedly, um, as all of you said, or at least implied, conservation does not occur without people. You know, Aldo Leopold coined that term, and it was all about uh, sustaining natural resources by people, for people, and natural functional systems. But one thing that none of you addressed is besides the importance of connecting with the people to ensue conservation, is that conservation cost. And while we're spending a lot of time and effort educating and connecting, revenue has to be generated. And what I preach a lot about nowadays is for us to consider following what I call the Missouri model we're one-eighth of one percent of all sales tax by whoever has a cent or a dollar to expend goes to conservation. Hmm. The word tax is beleaguered. We don't like to hear that. I like to call it a contribution. <laughs> a contribution for anyone who has a coin. Great. So, Gary et al., as you go across the country, Maybe that can be part of your message. As I know now, there's Missouri, Minnesota, Iowa, and Arkansas that have these conservation sales tax. How, how they're functioning, I do not know. And the last thing I'll say is one of your stops in the next year should be the Wildlife Society. And this video, or really y'all, should be on stage at the Wildlife Society annual conference 
Greg, where is it? Cleveland this year? Cleveland? Okay. Right. We'll so. get that invitation issued. <laughs> Gary, do you want to address that? Oh. Because it's kind of a political issue too, what uh, Dr. Kaminsky is bringing up. I, I would agree with you. I wouldn't call it a contribution. I think it's an investment. And there's a huge return on that investment that can happen. As far as funding, it's ironic to talk about a new kind of tax when the current administration is trying to reduce the land and water conservation fund that many of our local communities here in Carol, Carol, South Carolina depend upon to do the very things you say. That there are, so there are funding streams in place that need to be protected, as well as, as well as private philanthropy has to step up. America has created in its economic inequality some extraordinary numbers of very rich people. And there was another time when that happened, and they came around, the Carnegies and the Fords, et cetera, to realize they needed to reinvest in the country. The, the day will come when the Gates Foundation will see conservation as critical to healthcare, because what's more important to a doctor's patient than clean water and clean air? So I think the private sector needs to step up as well. We can't just rely on government. Another question? I want to hear from some of their students. I want to hear from some undergraduate and graduate students. What are we saying tonight that is engaging you? Yes, sir. Hang on, we've got a microphone for you right here. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Hunter Morton. I'm an excellent senior here at Clemson University. Uh, I'm a, ma a major in agriculture education and for the last five weeks, I've actually been uh, in a high school uh, teaching the future, uh, even more than me, uh, myself, the future of, of our conservation movement. And, Great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and one thing, one thing I, I've seen is that, uh, for one, the work ethic and the, and the drive for many of things is just not there as, as much as it used to be. Um, and we've talked about like the, uh, you know, the younger generation um, and the conservation movement. And I think one of the biggest things is getting the idea of conservation and natural resources in the minds of some students that don't know about it. Um, I'm actually a student teaching in, in Greenville, and I have a few students that are, are from the urban side of the uh, urban side of Greenville, and then some from the rural side. And uh, I have a friend of mine that's at Malden um, that's getting more of the city, and so. It's a vast difference between those experiences that you get as a young kid. Um, and I've started an organization where getting some of those children out there to really open up and get them some of those experiences. And it's amazing to see, uh, you know, a little kid catch their first fish or, you know, just getting into the environment. Um, because it's one of those things where that, that generation just hasn't gotten that, that opportunity. Um, so I feel like part of our, part of our, uh, effort should be getting that idea back into the to the minds of that younger generation, whether it's um, through their parents to them or just straight to them, because if they don't know about it, then they can't really be a part of it. Jane, Jane I, you know, and um, many of you know this young man, um, but um, Hunter is, you know, we talk about legacy. And, and in the conservation movement, we talk about how important that is, how it's passed on. And, um, and, and Hunter's mother and father, his parents, have passed that, that on to him. And I think part of that, that, that legacy, whether it's, whether it's through blood um, or through the passion that we have, is, is something that important. So again, Rob talks about stories, and we all have these stories. As a birder, I say everyone has a st bird story, mm -hmm. even if it's the chicken leg you ate last night. <laughs> that's um, that's a that's a bird that's a bird story. So, how do you relate your experiences in the environment, whatever those experiences might be? How do you relate that to the next person? You know, and and so thinking about where those people are, as Hunter talks about Greenville, and all you got to do is drive through through that metroplex and understand how it's growing. Um, that that we have to to relate to people in a different way, and again understand. So. You know, as, as much as it, it irks some people for me to do it, I don't take my phones from my kids when we're out. Now, I ask them not to take calls or text, 
but there, there's wonderful art to be captured on a cell phone camera, or to Instagram what they see, or to eBird. So, you know, those are ways that, that we meet this sort of challenge of legacy. And Jess did a wonderful job of talking about this and, and sort of where we meet people. So, you know, with all of my years of experience, I can't just take what I know and how I've done it and foist it upon Hunter or upon Jess. So it's, it's incumbent upon us, too, to learn. And people like Hunter and Jess are teaching us that. So thank you for, for that. Terrific. Thank you for speaking up, too. Questions? Yes, right here, this lady down the aisle. Hi, I'm Margaret Patacek. Mm -hmm. You guys know me. I'm from Biological Sciences. And I wanted to just follow up on Jess's comment and Hunter's as well about the importance of sending the conservation message to the K through 12 community. Mm -hmm. I've spent a number of years here at Clemson involved in um, science teacher education and helping science teachers to bring more science experiences, hands-on science experiences to classrooms. And currently I am in a reading program where I go to local elementary schools in the, the area, both Pickens and Oconee County. And what I see is that the socioeconomic divide in our country is getting greater and greater, as Gary points out in his book and many of you have spoken about. And we think about all of our childhoods where we became scientists and got interested in conservation because we grew up with those kind of mm -hmm. experiences. And I see children of all kinds, white, black, Latino, I see children who come from poor homes who don't go outside. Their parents don't go outside. And so I think if the conservation message is going to be handed to the next generation of children, then it's the responsibility of us as conservation scientists to take that to the schools, provide opportunities for teachers to teach the kids, even if all they do is grow a vegetable garden out there on the playground, because we cannot expect that their parents are going right. to instill those kinds of experiences for them. There's a terrific program in Spartanburg School District 6 where they actually have a farming program and they sell what they grow and they serve what they grow in the cafeteria. It's a terrific example, thanks to probably people that you taught, of what's going on in there. And yet, Gary, didn't you mention something that one of the, or was it Rob, that one of the fundings that's been cut was teaching scientists how to communicate? I mean, <laughs> I'm so, I know. Yes. yes, I love conservation, but I th it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter how much a professor knows. If they can't communicate it, it's all for naught, right? So it doesn't matter how passionate we are about this. If we can't communicate it to the public, then we're, you know, we're suffering. Um, to that point, yes, one of the ways that that cutting is occurring is by re arbitrarily reducing the ability of scientists to attend scientific meetings, federal scientists, to cut them off, to cut off the flow of information at the source, for mm. them not to participate with the university faculty at conferences and things. But to respond to your, to your comment about like how do we get young people, there were two practical strategies we tried during the Obama administration. One on the centennial is that for that year, the centennial, Every fourth grader in America got to go to national parks free for a year and take their family. That was a wise investment in getting young people out to parks with their parents. The second is a bio blitz, which is an amazing event that occurs at a park gathering hundreds of kids, sometimes thousands, for an intense day where they collect bugs and plants and all kinds of things and work with scientists to identify them. There's one other that I think is extraordinarily powerful and it's the most coolest thing we did. 
when you are a, becoming a new American citizen, and for the first time, citizenship naturalizations went on in parks, you could be naturalized at the Statue of Liberty or in Independence Hall, but when it took place, every new American got a little booklet that said an owner's guide, an owner's guide to the national parks. I believe that just like we need to do for children, new Americans need to be integrated into the American covenant that binds us together. And one of the coolest ways to do that is through the parks. And if I may just quickly ask Rob and Jesse, you work with people to create sustainable landscapes. You work with private landowners. Isn't that a great way of communicating too? You're kind of teaching people how to yeah. sustain. Yeah, when we make maps of the landscape, that's a model of the earth. And it's, um, you can play with it, you can change it. And the fact that you can do that attracts people to it. There's a attraction to maps. We all have this natural attraction to maps. It's a form of science, but it's very accessible. It's visual, and for people who have trouble with you know, regular charts and graphs, they love maps. So but just putting maps on the table can bring a lot of people to the problem who never would have thought of it or being part of that before. And, and in dealing with private landowners, I'm yeah, sure that's... people are curious. I find when I'm visiting landowners, they, they want to know what birds are in their yard. They're proud of having those birds there, even if they didn't do anything to attract them there. So people are curious. They're proud of their resources. And I think sometimes what I tend to do is listen first and hear what it is they are excited about. What, and then I, I rephrase how I talk to them in a way that I know is gonna resonate. And so I think it takes that moment of listening first and then decide, you know, adjusting your message. Yeah. One more thing to, to Margaret's point. Science is often attractive to misfits. Like, <laughs> well, scientists are kind of the weird. I mean, we're, we're different. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times we're the quiet kids or the ones that, you know, are, everyone's wondering where they are and they're in the pond. Um, chasing frogs. I think that's really important because STEM can often be seen as something that's elitist and exclusive and you get selected to do in a STEM mm -hmm. program. Well, maybe sometimes the best or the most curious or the most able or engaged people. You know, E.O. Wilson writes about that he himself, um, I think it was dyslexic, he had a learning disability and he writes about that when he was a child. And science and putting order to the natural world was his way of dealing with that. But we often exclude those kids from the outset from these things. We ought to attract them. We ought to find them and, and bring them in. I like that movement. <laughs> yes, right here in the middle, young lady in the Clemson shirt. And I am keeping my eye on the time because I want to make sure you all have an opportunity to have Gary sign your books. Uh, hi, I'm Abby. I am from Greenville, and I actually am, uh, not to make myself sound like a rock star, but I am your man on the ground uh, right now. I work at a science center with uh, K through 8th grade um, children, and we do, uh, we try to expose our children, um, Roper Mountain Science Center for anyone who's wondering, um, we try to expose our children to a variety of STEM options for them that they if I had to guess, would probably not stumble upon in their normal educational curriculum. Um, I grew up at the Science Center and I ended up uh, as a wildlife and fisheries biology major here at Clemson because of the outreach that I experienced from them. Um, and I actually have kind of a lightning round surface level question for you if you'll uh, indulge me on this one. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to let this out of the bag, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Uh, we have plans for a new building at the Science Center, and our new building is supposedly going to be aimed at sustainability and conservation sciences. Um, I'm so excited. Um, I actually want to end up working there. Um, after I get my degree here at Clemson, I would love to return back there and kind of 
uh, do what they did for me and inspire young girls in STEM because there's nothing I want more than that. Um, I want to be like you, Jesse. <laughs> you're, you're a rock star in my world right now. Um, but my question for you guys, um, like I said, more of a lightning round. What do you think would be an awesome thing to add to our new um, building, or our new exhibit, I guess, uh, for the younger kids, the uh, K through eighth grade? What do you want them to see about conservation? How do you want us to be able to teach them about conservation in their daily lives? That's a great question. So what will spark them? If you've just got them there for a day, and then let's just go down the road. Gary, what sparks them? A planetarium that doesn't look out to the stars, but looks down to the earth, like Rob said. And by the way, yes, I think that's great that you want to go back and work there, but what I recommend you do is run for office. <laughs> <laughs> you can do both. Most political people don't get paid a lot of money right at first, so do both. Rob? Fabulous. Uh, pond full of frogs that they can actually go in and catch. Chase them around, and if you need new frogs, go get some more. <laughs> True. I didn't say that. Um, you know, uh, that, that whole idea of being a bird, the ability to, to see your landscape, and so that the world is passing and whizzing by people. So, yeah, build a wind tunnel and let people fly in it. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Jesse turned into a butterfly? Well, <laughs> actually, it was going to be, I, I thought maybe um, Dr. Lanham would take mine. I was envisioning um, using sound, a soundscape or a bird song, because that's one thing they can take outside the building as they go on. Once you tune in, you can never really tune out. And so it's another yeah. sense that's often not um, tapped into. And that's a great question because children take home things to their parents. Yeah. When a child comes home, I'm sure from the Roper Mountain Science Center, although they've got a gigantic tarantula there that really I could do without, but when, when they take these things home to their parents and they say, I held a frog today, or I saw a butterfly, or I heard what a robin sounds like, or I saw what the earth really looks like, you're exciting and engaging the whole family, I think. We've got time for one more question. Do we, I'm sorry, I'm gonna, do we have a student? I don't wanna, are you a student? Okay, I'm sorry, are you a student? Used to be, I did too. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to ixnay you in favor of the student, but then you can ask. Someone back there. Good evening. My name is Aaron Shepard. I'm an electrical engineering student here at Clemson University, which it's kind of a world away being at a conserv conservation conversation. Um, as someone who sees the world in terms of components and bits and bytes, how do you how do you see technology? changing conservation and how do you integrate technology to make conservation better for our world? Wow, don't you love that question? We've got an engineer in the house, that's awesome. <laughs> oh, by, by the way, if you think scientists are weird, you should see what we do when we do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start on that end, Jesse. Uh, well, I'll give the millennial answer and, and, and <laughs> and say, I'm gonna take technology and think social media. I think processing things into sound bites, memes, little cartoons, and getting that information out there has never been easier, for better or worse. Um, so I just think, uh, we mentioned collapsing journals and articles into tweets, and um, I just think we can really harness that. We've been talking a lot about communication and the need for communication. Um, to work to our advantage. And so I think social media, and being open to doing things on new platforms is a great first step. Great. Who else wants to jump in on that one? That's great, Drew. Uh, well, that guy, that engineer happens to be my son-in-law, so. Oh, <laughs> you yeah, very well. Um, but I, you know, from, from the point, we do the, we do the rocket science. We do the drones, we do all the technology. And so conservation is such it's such a diverse field that almost anything that you can imagine doing comes back through conservation. It comes back through exploring our, our environment. And so it's not limited to, to what you might think it's limited to. So anything that you can imagine, we do. And so I, I think that's important at a land grant university for folks to understand who we are. We haven't done a good job of telling 
who we are. So from that technology standpoint, as Jess said, through social media communication, all those sorts of things, we do that. Awesome. Rob? Yeah, that's great. And true, that's a really good point. Um, I'll just tell a story. So a few years ago, <laughs> we were trying to do a big GIS problem uh, analyzing the protection levels of all 300,000 parks and protected areas in the, in the United States. And it was choking our machine. And we calculated it out and we realized that it was going to have to run for two years. And wow. this was our desktop. And so, you know, thank God for engineers because there was somebody who we were talking to who said, you know, we've got this piece of software and you can run an all it, this on all the GIS computers on campus. Um, so we learned to do that and we did. And that brought that down to, you know, a few hours. And then we got into bigger and bigger problems and somebody said, you know, we have the Palmetto cluster. And so of course that took a couple of years of learning to program it, but we got there. And when we finally learned to program the thing, it took us only a couple of minutes. But the reason we were able to do that is that NSF had funded an interpretive um, computer scientist whose job it was to go around campus and find people like us to help us access these resources. And we were in the long tail of science, so they would write their NSF proposals that always feature us because we were the unusual user of these things, right? But we, we was good for selling the proposal. We could not have done any of that without people like you. Just who found us and helped us to do awesome. these things. Yeah. Gary? Technology always has unintended consequences. <laughs> Every week a website is going dark where the data that you collect mm -hmm. is being restrained from civilian and citizen use. Every week long-term data sets are being cut and truncated so that they lose value. And every week there is silencing talking about climate change, for example. So one of the unintended consequences is how do you manage conservation technology in a way that improves access, follows democratic principles, is transparent, and is ethical? All of that matters. One personal note, I would argue in curmudgeon hood to my partners here, <laughs> that there should always be device-free spaces that we should always have a place where the cell phones won't work. Oh and that um, I think that at, like, and in practical terms, I can tell you the amount of pressure placed on the National Park Service to put cell phones practically everywhere, particularly so that rookie climbers climbing without proper training or equipment could feel that if they got in trouble, they could call and we would put park rangers in harm's way to rescue them. So I think there is some political dangers associated with conservation technology, and I would urge for device-free spaces to remain possible. And also remember that in some of those spaces, there are grizzly bears, and they will eat you. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Whether or not you have a cell phone. And you know what? It is cool. It is cool. Um, I, I really, it, can you ask a really fast question? Because I'm feeling guilty for leaving you out. Yes. Hang on, we've got a microphone right here, but make your question really fast. We'll answer quickly. I want to make sure we get to the book, but I hate leaving what anyone else. What I wanted else. to know is I wanted advice on how to be effective in contacting elected officials and trying to get this information presented to them in a way that they will take seriously. And I don't know what way that would be. The economic factor seems to be the only issue they listen to. How to be effective? Well, okay, I'm so glad that we didn't miss that question. That is a terrific question because we can encourage those of you to run for public office, be that voice, but we have public officials who probably would like to just hear from you and understand what's important to you. Gary? First, make sure that you have standing with the official you're writing to. Second, make it brief, make it clear, and make it specific. Third, 
remember that if, if, you had, if I had to recommend what are the two biggest things you could do as a conservationist, it would not be recycle your paper, ride a bicycle, compost your vegetable waste. It would be none of that. The two most important things as a conservationist are to vote and to bring someone else to vote. Mm. That's the most important step. So I think we've also redefined or defined clearly what conservation means. It's a broad, big, huge word. And at the end of the day, if we don't take a look at it, if we don't protect it, getting it back may be absolutely impossible. I want to make sure that we thank Gary Matchless, Rob Baldwin, Drew Lanham, Jesse Wood. Thanks to the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation. Thanks to the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. To Clemson University Institute for Parks and for the Margaret H. Lloyd Smart State Endowment. A big, big applause for our panelists and for Clemson University. Thank you. And a final word. This is an awesome read. This is an awesome read. It's right on sale at the very back. And you know what? You can stick it in your hip pocket. Just, you know, <laughs> you're going to write in it like I did. So buy two. <laughs> Gary will be able to sign them. We'll meet you in the lobby. Thank you all so much for being here.